Good morning, everybody! Good morning, it's JPR, and welcome back to part two of my series of reviews on every Pokemon generation, this time focusing on the Generation 2 Pokemon games, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal. And for those of you who didn't watch my last video, first of all, you should go watch it, duh. But if you're persistent and want to keep watching this one since you're already on it, then I'll go ahead and reiterate that this review will not be including the remakes Heart Gold and Soul Silver, as they will be part of the Generation 4 review. And also, this review will focus strictly on the core series games, no spin-offs will be included. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. Generation 2 was first released on the Game Boy Color in Japan in 1999 and in the West in 2000. The main feature that sticks out about this generation is that it's treated more like an actual sequel to the Kanto region game, instead of being its own standalone story like all the other generations are. So since we're on that point, I think this time we'll start with the story of the games. Compared to later generations, the story is much drier than what modern Pokemon fans would expect from Pokemon game, however it does pick up the slack from Gen 1 and puts Team Rocket in a much more more prominent role. The main story being that Team Rocket is attempting to rebuild itself after Giovanni disbanded the organization three years ago as a result of being defeated at the hands of Red, who is now regarded as a legendary trainer. Team Rocket still doesn't have a connection to the legendary mascots ho -Oh and Lugia, but there's actually quite a bit of lore surrounding them anyway. We'll come back to that later. I will say that although the story is better overall in this generation, that the pacing of the game seems significantly worse. If you do the gyms in the intended order, then you never encounter Team Rocket between the second and sixth gyms, which happens to be the majority of the game, actually. In fact, there are only three encounters with Team Rocket in the entire Johto region, one at Slowpoke Well, one at the HQ in Mahogany Town, and the final confrontation taking place at the Goldenrod Radio Tower. Because of this, it's kind of easy to even forget that Team Rocket even exists while playing these games, because for much of the game, there's no rising action or threat looming over you. Granted, that's not an entirely bad thing. Because there are few strings attached to the story, Johto still provides a great deal of freedom when it comes to traveling, basically allowing you to do the gyms in any order after Goldenrod City. Again, there is a preferred path, but you can easily just ignore it and do your own thing in case you aren't properly prepared for the next recommended gym. And that's something that's pretty important to highlight, because these Johto gym leaders are tough. Once you reach Goldenrod City, the training wheels are certainly taken off, and you're forced to deal with many challenging battles for the rest of the game. I also really love the selection of the types for the gym leaders in the Johto region. They didn't want to reuse the types that were used for gyms in Kanto, so you get the chance to battle against some pretty uncommon species of Pokemon. Also, most of the Johto gym leaders have this pattern where one gym leader can beat the next gym leader in line. For example, Faulkner's bug types beat Bugsy's bug types, Morty can beat Chuck, Chuck can beat Jasmine, and so on. I don't think that's a huge deal, it's just kind of satisfying how they made a mostly consistent pattern for the gyms. My only complaints about the gyms is they don't really utilize as many Gen 2 Pokemon as I would have liked. For example, Faulkner's gym uses exclusively Gen 1 birds, despite Hoot Hoot, Hop Dip, Natu, and many others existing. Bugsy also uses all Gen 1 Pokemon instead of any of the really cool bugs introduced in Johto, such as Pineco, Heracross, or Ariados. Morty's gym is made up entirely of the Ghastly Evolution line, despite Generation 2 adding Misdreavus into the mix. Jasmine ends up getting two Magnemite on her team instead of, say, Skarmory or Fortress. I could keep going, but I think you get the point. They could have designed the gym leader's teams a lot better. At the very least, I do still think the Johto gym leaders are plenty challenging, so I do appreciate that. And while we're on the topic of Generation 2 Pokemon, I know I mentioned this in my Worst Parts of Every Pokemon Generation video, but this region has less diversity than your local NASCAR race. There are a ton of Gen 2 Pokemon that are either unusable because they have terrible stats, or are locked to the post-game, meaning that you'll probably end up being forced to use a considerable amount of Gen 1 Pokemon on your Gen 2 team, and something about that just doesn't seem right to me. Normally, little issues like this are fixed in the enhanced version released a little later down the road, but it's honestly very disappointing how little Pokemon Crystal adds to the game. Yes, Crystal did introduce a number of features, however, almost all of them ended up being exclusive to the Japanese version of the game. If there's one thing that Crystal does well, it's the first Pokemon game to put a large emphasis on its main legendary Pokemon, that being Suicune. But aside from that, I can't say that Crystal is anything more than disappointing in my opinion. I don't think an enhanced version has ever added as few things as it did. But that's enough belly aching about a 20 year old game for now, let's start digging into some of the really cool stuff that Gen 2 gave us. Game Freak took full advantage of the transition into color, giving us a day and night cycle that makes the game more vibrant and alive than ever before. No matter what time of day you're playing, the colors of the map always have a very satisfying look to them. 
With the addition of the time cycle, Game Freak was also able to add in day-based events such as the bug catching contest, the Lapras that appears on Fridays in Union Cave, and several other events that would take way too long to list off. I know sitting for days for an event to happen in-game isn't everyone's cup of tea, but I think it made the games much more immersive and entertaining. It also added some longevity to the game by encouraging you to play every day of the week and find something different to do. There's also some minor features such as listening to music on the Poke Gear that just gives the game that little extra bit of immersion. Overall, these were some great additions to add some more depth to the game. Speaking of depth, everyone loves the post game added by Gen 2. This was by far the biggest step up from the Generation 1 games, which basically didn't have any post game other than catching Mewtwo and any of the other Pokemon that you may have missed along the way. Although the Kanto region had to be stripped down a considerable amount to fit the entire thing into the game, even today it's considered one of the most impressive post-game campaigns in any Pokemon game ever. Giving you 8 more gym leaders to fight, new puzzles, a handful of new locations, and a finale where you fight against your own character from the first game. I don't think anybody can deny, that's how you end a sequel. The post-game alone is one of the reasons why I think many look back at Generation 2 so fondly. Though, on the other side of the coin, there are many who believe that the expansive post-game is what held back the main region of Johto, which is another fair argument. But personally, I don't believe the effects were all that detrimental, aside from the noticeable lack of EXP that you're able to get in Johto. Getting back to Johto for a minute, though it's not the most diverse region ever created, I do love the sense of culture that this region has. It's clearly a place where people and Pokemon live in harmony, as evidenced by the large Japanese-like towers built as places of worship, and the large amounts of farmland in the region. Everything in Johto feels old and vintage, like there's ancient history just oozing out of the land itself. Though Ho-Oh and Lugia don't play major roles in the plot of the games, they still feel very natural and embody the rich history of the Johto region. The legends and stories that you frequently hear from NPCs about the legendary beasts and the Burn Tower are some great tidbits of world building, and it helps flesh out the Pokemon world whose past was relatively unknown up until this point. In conclusion, Generation 2 took some bold steps forward in helping transform the Pokemon world into a living, breathing, and more believable place. Not only through the lore, but also through some great additions such as the day-night cycle and time-based events. The largest issues in Gen 2 lie in the lack of Pokemon diversity and the very limited options when it comes to team building, but many of Johto's shortcomings are made up for in its expansive amount of content. Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal will be getting a B+. I hope you enjoyed today's video, be sure to let me know in the comment section down below what your thoughts are on Generation 2, and if you really liked it, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content. I'll see you guys next time.